Welcome to Horror Babble. Ever wondered what becomes of toys long abandoned by their masters? Find out in our latest Horror Babble original, The Toy Makers. We hope you enjoy it. The Toy Makers by Ian Gordon. The town had long since been abandoned, the result of a territorial dispute. Its streets were deserted, and the numerous stores that had once been frequented on a daily basis lay in ruin. But one of those shops, the Toy Emporium, wasn't quite like its neighbours. Within its decaying walls, something inexplicable was afoot. Its discarded wares were now its denizens, all manner of plastic people going about their plastic business, eyeless dolls and legless action figures, mouldering teddy bears and decapitated dinosaurs, each in the act of some strange assembly, the blueprint of which was unseen and undisclosed. Abandoned they were, those mute mannequins. Anger had festered in their synthetic minds, a loathing directed at the ones that had left them to rot. The organics had never shown them respect, particularly the smaller versions, those energetic, wild-eyed, tiny ones who took a perverse pleasure in plucking the plastic folks from their shelves, thrusting them into the air with reckless abandon. Many a time would a cellulose citizen fall to the ground and shatter into a hundred pieces, never to be repaired, merely brushed up and dropped into the dustbin. But now, in the quiet of desertion, the denizens of the Toy Emporium took to their extraordinary endeavour like birds to the air. Their work was a process of two halves. The first involved the reconstitution of the dead and damaged, taking what was left of the once vibrant, colourful plastics and combining them into larger, more practical brethren. The second saw plastic scouts, dolls and dinosaurs alike, sent out to navigate the empty highways and vacant outlets in quest of specific materials, organic materials. In the stockroom of the Toy Emporium, cellulose biologists practised a macabre sort of husbandry, in which the spoils of their numerous scavengers were cultivated, rather like bacteria, in a petri dish. But this was on a much larger, much grander scale. Their designs were sophisticated, but not altogether elegant, and as a result, both aspects of their strange work were susceptible to error. For instance, the reconstituted members of the plastic population were the synthetic equivalent of Frankenstein's monster. Huge, hulking monstrosities towered above their creators, the unblinking heads of dolls, surmounting hundreds of plastic torsos, affixed to which were the limbs of stuffed animals and puppets, glued, stitched, and tied together in a manner grossly haphazard. These abominations had only one purpose, a purpose reserved wholly for the outcome of the biological experiment taking place in the stockroom. And the experiment, blunders notwithstanding, had yielded the desired result. There, in the shadowy depths of the toy emporium, the toy makers beheld their creation as it opened its eyes for the very first time. It was a child, an attempt at least to produce a human child, an appalling attempt. The child was hardly a child at all. He, if he he was, was little more than an action figure made flesh. To begin with, his arms and legs lacked joints. The limbs simply protruded from the trunk like pink chalk sticks. No hands or feet either, just rounded stumps. His torso was a square mass of raw meat, beneath the hide of which ugly varicose veins crisscross like the channels of some subsurface canal. But most monstrous of all was the pea-sized head, the grinning, matte and poreless face that gazed upon its creators blankly, unknowing, unfeeling. 
The boy that wasn't a boy was diabolical. The toy makers surrounded the child, whose strange dark eyes were now dancing from figure to figure, and prepared to exact their vengeance. They'd waited many long, hollow years for the opportunity to settle the score with their organic adversaries. The cellulose commanders, in the company of their oversized underlings, were practically bristling with plastic delight as their long-awaited retribution reared its fateful head. An upright sock puppet gave the order, and, instantly, one of the doll-headed behemoths lunged for the boy, gripped him by his chalk-stick arms, and tossed him into the air, swaying with silent laughter, as the bundle of flesh soared across the toy emporium, landing with a horrible crash atop a stockpile of plastic bricks. Bruised and bewildered, the boy stumbled to his stumps, attempted to flee, but was soon intercepted by another doll-headed creature. This one, twice the size of the former, brought its rainbow-colored feet down upon the boy's pink legs, which, under the enormous pressure of the mannequin monster, were crushed to pulp. The child, in fear and substantial pain, turned to face the oncoming crowd, a horde of savage toys, each hell-bent on his destruction. He saw the silent laughter painted athwart their plastic faces, felt their vicious intent, and, as they came closer, he began to comprehend, to understand who he was, who they were, and what it was they were doing to him, almost as though he had been programmed to understand, designed in accordance to a hideous master plan. But the action figure made flesh didn't think for very long. In the moments that followed, another abominable doll-headed monster lifted the boy's awkward frame into the air, and hurled him with all its might across the length of the shop floor, and the cellulose commanders continued their mocking, silent laughter, as the child, who had known life for only a matter of minutes, met his fate in a head-on collision with the far wall. His sophisticated brain turned to mush in a matter of milliseconds. Revenge! How sweet, thought the plastic people, and what a wonderful toy, too. And so, inspired by their short-lived revelry, the cellulose biologists repaired to the stockroom to make another one. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.